Well, a happy Holy Week Monday to you. I am very happy to be with you today. I miss the time that I was not able to be with you because I was working on uh, my other stuff like getting the campground up and going. If you've not watched my videos before, I'll just give you a little update. My name is Reverend Alicia Leslie from Spirit of Unity Church and Unlimited Cyber Ministry. I call myself the mundane mystic because my goal is to bring spirit into our everyday lives to help to teach people how to connect the principles of truth that will bless us all into the mundane activities of everyday life. So, you know, it's like first we want to learn the principles and then we want to apply them. You know, applied knowledge is nothing but data. But, no, unapplied knowledge, excuse me. <laughs> unapplied knowledge is nothing but data. But applied knowledge is wisdom. That means we have engaged and used the principles. And you know, that's what unity says. We say we're not here to tell you anything you don't know already. We're not here with any uh, wonderful um, uh, new uh, theories on uh, spirituality. We're here to show you how the principles work in our lives. Why? So you can work them in your own life and have a better and a happier life. So there. Um, if you like my video, please do check like. And if you um, don't have time to watch it today, you can check it out on, on YouTube. I post it there on the Mundane Mystic page. Now every day we start our videos uh, with a look at the National Day Calendar. Now you see, from the perspective of a mundane mystic, the daily calendar, the National Daily Calendar, gives us examples to look at and to see how those days work in our everyday lives and how they dovetail with or align with, or we can align them with spiritual principle. So on this Holy Week Monday, and by the way, the theme of this is cleansing the temple, which we'll talk about in a minute. Today is pet day. You know, it's been just over a week ago that I lost my precious Tishy, my companion for 22 years, uh, my buddy, the one who loved me unconditionally, even if I'd go away for uh, a couple of weeks on vacation, I'd come home and, and she'd be there forgiving me and loving me. But she knew I didn't just like leave her. Whenever I went on vacation, I would make sure my sister was willing and able to come and take care of her. Now, when I say come take care of her, I don't mean clitter, clean the litter box and, you know, put food in her dish. She came and spent time and loved Tishy up and let her know she was not alone. And she did not do that just once a day. She did it at least three times a day. See, pets are not just animals that we get to fill some kind of void or something in our lives, they're a sacred trust. Every pet that we have is a sacred trust and gives us unconditional love. So even if your puppy or cat or whatever you've got gets on your nerves, remember they give you companionship, 
unconditional love. Sometimes a playmate to throw the frisbee or to my my tissue used to chase after a little red rabbit's foot. I know I hate to say it, but she did have a rabbit's foot. It is what it is. Um, it was her favorite pet, uh, uh, favorite toy, and she'd go catch it and bring it to me. And, you know, Tishy's big mouth, God bless her, loudest cat I know. <laughs> and she, meow, meow, okay, toss it again, let me catch that rabbit's foot. We did not buy it. The rabbit's foot came from a place called um, Mr. Gaddy in, uh, it's in South Texas, and my parents loved going there. It was like Chuck E. Cheese, only believe it or not crazier and you know the kids get the tickets out of the machine and then they pick out toys and well one day samantha picked out a, a little rabbit's foot for tishy so um she's probably in heaven now playing with sammy and her little red rabbit's foot okay it is also cheese fondue day which I am, uh, if you've not had cheese fondue, fondue, you should. But get it somewhere at like a restaurant called the Melting Pot, which is a little pricey, but they serve very good fondue there. It's something if you have it at home, you're probably going to eat too much, and I'm trying to cut back on that a little bit. Um, and it's another day. It's Barbershop Quartet Day. I want to tell you how Barbershop Quartets and metaphysics work together. How do you like that? Um, bar, in barbershop quartets, quartets, they've got four different lines of music they sing. In order to be able to be in a quartet, you have to be very grounded in your part because each part sings the song just a little differently. And in, you have to really, really focus and not look at what everyone else is doing and accidentally start following their, their notes instead of your own. Isn't that just like life? When you go through life, we all have our own path. And it is ours to follow that path and not to be distracted or sucked into somebody else's path. I'm currently uh, listening to a book on Audible about um, empaths. I'm an empath, but I didn't discover it until late in life, and now I've figured out a lot of <laughs> a lot of what my pain and suffering was about earlier in life. But the thing with an empath is they are very easily focused on what other people are feeling, which is good in the way that it's important. We should be aware of others' feelings, of course. And it's, it's a gift to be able to intuit how to help them. But an empaths are very likely to go around trying to live their emotions and not their own. So the barbershop quartet is a beautiful example of being able to focus on what your part is. And when you're doing your part, all the other parts are what? In harmony. Not unison, harmony. And I think that's just a beautiful spiritual lesson. Now, another day on the National Day calendar that comes up today, it is National Submarine Day. I don't know what you know about submarines. I don't know a lot. I know that my brother-in-law's brother was on a submarine. And as I read the information on National Submarine Day, I said, you know what? I got to have a talk with Bobby. I want to know more about what it's like to be on a submarine. He was in the Navy uh, and served on a submarine. Now, I'll tell you what I do know about submarines. What I knew for many years now, there is a submarine which was one of the first nuclear submarines, I believe, and it was called the Croker. 
Crocker was a very small submarine, and for a while, back in about 1970s, it was docked in New London, Connecticut, or Groton, probably Groton, that's where they make submarines, I think. And my children were small, and we went to see the Croker. It was one of those, okay, let's do something today, let's go explore a bit, and we decided to explore the Croker. I walked into that submarine, and remember, I didn't know it then, but being an empath, I was, I felt almost attacked with the energy of that small space, like claustrophobic. And we toured, we toured the little submarine, and we saw that men would, as they probably do now, sleep over torpedoes. There were torpedoes right under their mattress, unless they were on the second bunk, the above bunk. Now, another thing you have to know about the people that were on those submarines is they did what they called hot bedding. Hot bedding means the bed never got a chance to get cold, but it didn't cool off because when one sailor would get up and go off to do his work, it would be another one's time to come off of his shift and share that bunk. You think about that when you get into your very own bed tonight and you know nobody's going to be in it or has been in it but you and you're not sleeping on a torpedo, what some people had to do for our freedom. The other thing that struck me about another thing that struck me about being on the croaker is nobody got to take a shower until the showers, which were filled with fresh produce, produce, were empty. So they had to eat their way through the shower's produce in order to have access to take a shower. And the scariest part of taking that tour on the croaker was um, in the engine room. There was a graded floor on the, uh, in the engine room, and that graded floor got really hot. And it got so hot, the sailor would have to keep moving their feet back and forth. Why? So their sneakers didn't melt to the grating. I will tell you how I came off of the croaker. I came off in tears. I've always known that war is not the answer to peace. It is a condition that we live in, and for whatever it's worth, it is what it is. But I'll tell you something, I got to give those guys credit, because lots of job I don't think I could ever do. I don't even know. If I was forced, I'd probably go berserk and bring the whole damn ship down. Just saying. Okay, uh, but here's some good news. One thinks of a submarine, and what do you think of? The Navy, military, war, a periscope. No, submarines are not just for war. They're for ocean exploration. They're for salvage, sometimes rescue, but it's usually rescue of stuff, not people. And would you believe, oh, archaeology, and would you believe, um, tourism. Well, you're not going to find me a tourist on any submarine. I'm just saying. You can find lots of information on submarines. Where else? Google. Okay, so now I would like to talk about uh, our Monday topic, which is cleansing the temple. We are preparing for Easter. Easter is when, in the Christian tradition, we celebrate Jesus rising from the dead, because that's what it looks like to us. But we remember Jesus taught eternal life. So 
perhaps it was moving from one form to another, but the term rising is very important because we have to ask ourselves, what's keeping us down? If we want to rise, we have to rise above something and what we are rising above, in order to do that, we have to cleanse it. We have to remove it. We are told that our bodies are the temple of the living God. And that that spark of divinity that is inside of us, it is a spark, is the divine spark, we call it the Christ, is our God spark, okay? And it's perfect. And it is within our spirit. So our spirit never needs to be cleansed. Our spirit is what we are trying to transform the rest of us to a point of being able to be lifted up. A lot of people in unity don't like to uh, address the fact that Charles Fillmore, the co-founder of unity, believed that if we purified ourselves completely, that we would live in these bodies eternally. There would be no reason to die. And then he died. Well, let me tell you something, that put a, you know, a shock wave through the unity movement. But the spirit, and he taught that the spirit doesn't die. And right before his death, he spoke and he said, I see the new Jerusalem and it is beautiful and it is amazing but we can't go there until we rise above the things that are keeping us down so there is stuff cluttering our consciousness that we want to let go of. And to mo today's Monday, cleansing the temple, that's what we're talking about. So what kind of things do you think you have to cleanse from your temple of consciousness? How about some forgiveness? Is there something you need to let go of? Is there, is there resentment? anger, negativity. You can be free only if you learn to let go. Forgiveness is a gift we give ourselves. It's not something we give somebody else. What else? We, our lives can be filled with false beliefs. Yesterday morning, yeah, when I did the, the Palm Sunday service uh, for the campers who I was blessed, asked for me to do a service. And I did that prayer meditation, which I repeated for you only. They're never two the same. But we talked about it even after the service. All the lies that we believe that are not true. We have lies where we believe we can manipulate other people. You know, a funny version of that is I love Lucy. Lucy was always trying to manipulate uh, Desi. If it was, oh, that was, no, that wasn't his name, was it? Ricky. <laughs> his name was Desi, but his screen name in that was uh, Ricky. She would, if she couldn't, if she couldn't be manipulating Ricky, she'd be manipulating Ethel or anybody else was into her reach. Manipulation never works. You can try to manipulate someone. It's like many churches try to convert people. See, real conversion is not done from outside. It comes from within. 
our spirit calls us. We hear, we may hear something and we go, oh my God, that's true. And we align with it and you say, but I've always known that. Think about the things you've always known. Nobody had to teach them to you because you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You already know the truth. You just have to become aware of it. There are false beliefs that say you have to work hard for a living. You have to work hard for a living? Not really. If you like your work, if you love your work, your work is play and you play all day. Whatever that work is. I, when I was in seminary, I cleaned a 12-room house. And believe me, those people lived in every single room. And the last day I cleaned that house, when my uh, friends that owned the house had, we'd all been ordained and they were going off to their first ministry, um, they went off and uh, I cleaned the house for the last time because they were selling it. And on that last day that I cleaned their house, I cried. I did so much growing and healing. It was amazing. Now, I don't know what your stuff is. I don't know what your baggage is. But you have got <laughs> 24 hours to think about what do you have to cleanse from your temple? Don't let it go only as, as uh, you know, your mind. You, can, you have to let go of stuff in your body, in your mind, and in your soul. And you can actually do a lot of that work like I did back then. Cleaning. So if you start to go through your home and let go let go of stuff you don't need. Let it go. Give it away. Give it to Goodwill. Sell it. Do whatever you have to do. Just lighten up and cleanse the temple. You have a great rest of your day. I will look forward to seeing you uh, tomorrow. Good Lord willing and the brick don't rise. And until then, be blessed. Bye-bye.